The Vampire and Lycan clans had been at war for centuries before I was born. Their endless conflict hidden from the human world. I was turned by a vampire and given the strength to avenge my family against the Lycans, and I was good at it. Welcome to Now Playing Podcast's Underworld Retrospective Series. The Salingo's trouble surely follows. Hosted by Arnie. Information is power, and I collect it. With a passion. Jacob. I know exactly what you are. And Stuart. He's too powerful for you alone. But be warned, this episode will contain detailed plot spoilers and strong language. The sun will burn you to ashes out there, or you can die with some grace in here. We hope you enjoy the show. Show me what you have. Yes, sir. Today, we're discussing Underworld, Blood Wars, starring Kate Beckinsale, Theo James, Laura Pulver, James Faulkner, Charles Dance, directed by Anna Forster. This is Arnie, co-host of Now Playing, here with two others, because together, we are strong. Like apes. (laughs) Not feeling strong at this moment, five movies in. It's Stuart. Yeah, and this is the co-host who's back to deal some death, Jacob. Mm-hmm. You didn't even bother, huh? Not for five. <laughs> no, <Nope>. just showed my hand. <laughs> it's been four years since things were supposedly awakening, and I feel like they're just jumping into the crypt here. Kate Beckinsale, she's back. She's divorced. I think that's the reason why we don't get much Lynn Wiseman involvement in this one. She hadn't really worked a lot in between 2012 and 2017 when this is coming out. She had made a movie I didn't realize I had forgotten I had seen it until I was looking at things she had done. But she did get some acclaim for this Jane Austen costume drama called Love and Friendship that people really dug at the time. If you like those kind of corset comedies. My memory serves she was a real bitchy in it and was kind of fun. But (laughs) I had totally forgot that I saw it. Never heard of it. This movie was a bit of a mess in happening. Oh, it's a mess on screen. We can see that. It's all (laughs) over the place. Yes. They were going to just reboot Underworld. That was the initial thought is, we've taken it to its place. Let's just clean it up. I think this is when Beckinsale wasn't going to come back. Mm, Yeah, then you have to reboot. You're absolutely right. If you bring her back, then you're saying that this is a sequel. If you don't bring her back, you have to relaunch it. There was a thought, though, of making it a pseudo-reboot, Underworld, Next Generation, where David would be the lead character. Again, I don't think they were getting Beckinsale back in this case, but... David? Wouldn't you get Eve? Wouldn't you get the child? I mean, that's the next generation. I am guessing it would be David going after Eve, and Celine would just be written off as dead. Mm Mm-hmm. That's how I would see that one going. But David would be our new hero vampire. Eve is too young to carry the franchise. They told us Michael's coming back, that they're on the search for Michael. I totally guessed wrong on what was supposed <laughs> to be happening in this movie. I'm like, it'll be like Twilight. Nope, not unless Bella gets herself mummified and disappears for half the movie. Yeah, why she hangs out with some Viking vampires. <laughs> But after only a couple of months of this going about, Len Wiseman got Kate Beckinsale back on board and... Not with the marriage, but with the franchise. (laughs) And so they decided to go ahead and make another one, presumably the last one. At the time, Beckinsale said she had no interest in returning to the character. Clearly. I believe her exact phrase was, I've done enough of those. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, Kate, the ship has sailed. It's more like it. Yeah, she's over this. I've been saying this the whole time, though. I don't ever feel like her heart was into this. I feel like she thought that she needed to diversify as an actress and do one of those action movies. And she got attached to this because she fell in love with the director. And then it sort of damned her career. I mean, who knows if she wouldn't look more like Kate Winslet, have more of that kind of career if she hadn't made so many of these shitty kung fu vampire movies. Meanwhile, I would have just wished Kate Winslet would have actually dropped the corset once in a while and made a leather-clad Matrix ripoff. (laughs) (laughs) 
I think her instincts are right. She has diversified. We're going to talk about one of her non-corset roles as a bonus show pretty soon. But by and large, I agree. It became her brand to become the new Meryl Streep. And it became Kate Beckinsale's brand to take Mila Jovovich parts. This one, I mean, I think it was trendy around this time. We want to see women behind the camera more. I noticed that it is a female director. Anna Forrester was Roland Emmerich's cinematographer. She had done some serial television. This is her first feature film. I think probably her last. Her only feature film, yeah. She did that (laughs) series Outlander that I hear good things about, but she did like four episodes of that TV series. She's, yeah, mostly a camera person, second unit type thing. So maybe she can at least bring a good look here. Eh, not if you're slashing the budget in half. Yeah, what is the budget of this film? It's low, I know that. Awakening, we all said 70 million. You could see it on screen. This one went back to being 35. You can see it on screen. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Actually, you cannot see this movie. I feel like my struggle is eye strain. This movie is so dark and not in a cool way. That's been my problem with all of these except for. Yeah, this one is an underlit underexposed affair. Well, you see that CGI on the werewolves? That's why you underlined it. (laughs) I did watch this in 3D, and I thought some of the dimness might be the glasses. This was 3D? Oh, wow, they did do a 3D then. Okay, I thought maybe they dropped that. You know, by 2017, people had largely given up on 3D. Yeah, it was filmed with red cameras again. I do think, based on the 3D, it might have been a post-conversion job, because... It doesn't have nearly the vividness and the depth that I got out of the previous one. No. You know what makes me laugh is like to kind of pump this one up and promote it. While everyone else on the planet was playing Pokemon Go, they decide we're doing trading cards. We have an underworld trading card game in which you can buy packs of 30 and be vampires, lichens, and humans, Pokemon style. You're fighting each other and trying to... Catch them all. All 571 characters. And as the fan of this series, I did my due diligence and was so glad to find that game's no longer available. (laughs) (laughs) One year it lasted. It came out a couple months before this movie's January release. And then by October of the same year, it was shuttered. Yeah, you could be humans in it because it seems like they forgot that humans were at war with these vampires and lichens in this film. The major seven you were hoping to find would be Celine, Samira, and David, which are of the vampires. No Eve or Michael. Those really important characters in the franchise, they're God, just like in this movie. Quint, Marius, and Gregor were the Lycans. And then they had Detective Sebastian to represent the humans, the cop from Awakening. He had his own card. Those were the seven that were really powerful. And then they had just a bunch of generic humans, vampires, werewolves to fill out the deck. Where's my Charles Dance card? (laughs) Maybe it was licensing and some people wouldn't give their likeness. I don't know how those deals work. I don't think we're meant to understand. And quite frankly, I didn't care enough to even buy these. You can't buy them. They weren't physical cards. It was a virtual card game. Oh, so this was like an app. Yeah, it was an app and it's no longer in the stores. So like Flappy Bird, if you still have it on your phone, Mm. you can probably get a lot of money for it. (laughs) It wasn't popular and this movie wasn't popular. I mean, I do think we're not spoiling anything about what we think of it to go ahead and say that this movie had lower than expected box office and grumblings the people that i knew that call themselves fans talk about this one being their least favorite by far that it was over either they were done with the underworld or they really shit the bed i couldn't figure out from what people were saying but this one is not a popular entry in the saga yeah it still made money though again by cutting the budget in half and getting a worldwide gross of 80 million plus somebody bought it on blu-ray i did in 3d so they made their money you say that but 35 million budget with when you add in the advertising cost and all of that internationally to only gross 80 is basically breaking even it's certainly not making a profit they might not have lost their shirt but there's reason to think that if we're going to do this again we're not going to go in this direction anymore I mean, if you're going to have an effects-driven action film with vampires and lichens, you got to have more than $35 million. <laughs> If that's your budget, don't do it. I've seen many zombie movies that look made for about 50000 most of them based on video games, so I don't know why you can't do vampires that cheap. 
You shouldn't do. Let's rephrase that. <laughs> yes. You could do them with your iPhone right now. Uvabol could do it all he wants. Yes. But don't, please. But I don't want to see them if they don't if they cost less than that. Uva has more money than like that fucking dead trigger shit. <laughs> well, let's talk about what they did do. Arnie, give them the plot and we'll enjoy this blood war. The war between the lichens and the vampires is nearing its end. No, it's not. They've been telling us that for <laughs> five movies now. <laughs> and the more adaptive werewolves are proving victorious. Very few clans of vampires remain. Yet both clans seek Selene, again played by Kate Beckinsale, and her hybrid daughter Eve. Each side sees Eve's blood as a way to make themselves stronger and have a decisive victory. To protect the young girl, Celine sent her away and has no knowledge of Eve's whereabouts. Celine and her death dealer friend David, played by Theo James, are called to the Eastern Vampire Coven, summoned by the elders who want Celine to train a new generation of death dealers to fight the Lycans. This is a ruse, however. Council member Samira, played by Laura Pulver, has designs of ruling the Eastern Coven. She believes with Selene's pure blood, she will become powerful enough to overthrow the elders. Samira poisons Selene, who nearly dies before she's rescued by David. Samira framed Selene for the murder of several vampires, so Selene and David flee to the Nordic Coven. <laughs> <laughs> Let that set in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the Nordic Coven. And I think they drive there. I mean, look, if they want to have Thor show up as a vampire, I am down for that, but not on this $35 million budget. <laughs> there, David learns he's the son of vampire Grand Elder Amelia, thus making David the rightful ruler of the Eastern Coven. They're still trying to tell us Amelia's important. <laughs> <laughs> the character that Arnie didn't even notice in the first movie. <laughs> yeah, just got shot in the head in the first one. <laughs> She's walking through a train and gets gunned down. Super important. If you guys hadn't made fun of me for not noticing her, I'd still be like, who the hell's Amelia? <laughs> I'm glad we could help out. The Lycans attack the Nordic Coven. The new Lycan leader, Marius, played by Tobias Menzies, tortures Selene to find out the location of Eve. When Marius is convinced Selene doesn't know, he kills her. But the Nordic Coven have rituals to allow vampires to travel into death and then return blonde. <laughs> She's only half blonde. She hasn't fully converted yet. <laughs> Whew, I can't wait to talk about it. <laughs> David and Selene return to the Eastern Coven. They expose Samira's treachery, but before she can be captured, the Coven is overrun by a lichen attack. David and Selene, both immune to sunlight due to their pure blood, lead the fight. David kills Samira while Selene finally kills Marius. With the Lycan leader dead, the other werewolves retreat, and David and Selene, along with Nordic vampire Lena, are chosen as the new elders as credits roll. Hey, guess what? This starts with the voiceover. What a shock. No, 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 no. It starts with the exact same voiceover <laughs> and footage as part four. I thought I put in the wrong damn disc because it is the exact same until it also starts to recap part four as well. I'm just grateful she went on that ledge. I was on the ledge. I'm like, I'm going to jump off and kill myself if we got her yet again monologuing from that balcony. You're right. They've essentially YouTubed the first, wait, one, two, and four movies. They skip over three. I did appreciate one thing in the voiceover. I thought Eve might be like a clone or something. Test tube baby. We discussed that. But no, it was an unknown pregnancy. She just had a little zygote growing in her when she's put on ice. Yeah, she hadn't realized she was pregnant. I assume she... Yeah, we saw that sex scene with Michael. So, yeah, it's his baby. And the other thing that's helpful here is she says her only choice was to hide Eve from the world so that not even I could lead them, meaning people that want her, vampires and lichens, to her. I don't know how you do that. Do you just push her down the slide and then run the other direction, like drop her off at Chuck E. Cheese with five tokens and drive away? <laughs> Did they forget that Celine could see through her eyes and probably figure out from context clues where she is? There's some stuff at the end of this movie that tells me they didn't fully forget it. But what's going to be said in this movie is Eve is like, you're an absentee mom. You were on ice my whole life, so I don't want you. You're a bad mom. I want you to leave me alone. And so Eve stormed off and Celine didn't follow because it's better for Eve. Oh. 
That's what happened? You got that from this movie? Yeah, there's this teary scene where Celine is crying and saying how Eve didn't want her as a mother and she was so bad a mom and all of this. Oh, was there some really dramatic, well-acted, heart-wrenching scene in this? No, but there was tears. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as we start here, Celine is, again, I couldn't have said it better. I've lived beyond my time. You are damn right. Underworld 5, we're over this shit. <laughs> it's 2017. Matrix ain't a thing anymore. Romeo and Juliet ain't a thing anymore. Twilight ain't a thing anymore. What are we doing here with you shooting at werewolves on motorcycle? And... I'll give Kate Beckinsale this, though. We've watched these movies pretty much back to back. I've seen her age, but it doesn't feel like she's 15 years older. As far as an ageless vampire goes, she has stayed pretty wrinkle-free and youthful. Yeah, when you pancake that much foundation on your face, <laughs> it's easy to hide. And she's going to go gray in this one. They're going to streak it up real cool, so she doesn't have to worry about her hair changing color. They'll do it for her. And... I was shocked. I had no idea what I was in for with this movie. I knew Celine would be back, that David was going to be right there with her in those early scenes. I'm like, okay, so they're bringing him back this time. He did not feel central enough to the series. But you'd mentioned maybe he was the other lover. You're torn between the werewolf and the vampire. So seeing him back here again, I definitely thought, okay... I know Scott Speedman is not returning ever to this franchise. Maybe they will go that way. I went the other way. I thought for sure Scott Speedman, they could clean him up and get him back for this movie. At this point, he'd be willing to do it for the work. And I, again, I, I imagined a love triangle between him and David. Like you said, Arnie, we've been watching these mostly back to back to back week after week. If it had been four or five years, though, between four and five, David who? Like, they do not fill us in. I think there's some line later how she brought him back to life, but this does not feel like a character I was supposed to remember from the last one. And I even put a question mark. I'm like, is this David? Okay, <laughs> later it confirms it's him. But like, yeah, I'm like, who is this guy just walking around all of a sudden? Yeah, he drives up in a sports car. She's being hauled off by Lycans. Help me out with this. They want Eve. We'll find out the Lycan plot is we need hybrid blood. That means we need the blood of your child. But there is something about her blood that's special. She can walk around in daylight. She did have that old vampire on the boat do something with her. Yeah, she got bit or whatever by Cornelius, which made her a day walker. Like, just drink her blood. They said that she has, yeah, some pure blood in her from part two there. But she's not a hybrid. I don't think any werewolf is going to benefit from Celine. Only other vampires are going to benefit. But Michael was made by first being a lichen and then getting bit by Celine. Just get Celine's blood, then you're all like Michael. Yeah, Corvinius was the father of werewolves and vampires, but he was neither. So I guess having his blood isn't... I mean, they all would have it, I would think. I don't know. I get real grossed out by all the blood swapping in this <laughs> one. I'm like, I guess we're not addressing AIDS or any other blood-borne diseases. Never watch Interview with a Vampire, Jacob. <laughs> Never do an interview, because you will not deal. Yeah, I'm like, I need a genealogy chart for whose blood is in who in this thing. I'll admit, I had to look up Corvinius, because I'm like, wait, who's her daddy? Oh, wait, okay, it's because of the guy in part two making her super. Right. And there is some guy here that is named Gregor. I don't know that we get that name, but the point is that Celine puts two bullets in him and sends him off to go talk to his new leader, Marius, and tell him, don't try and find my daughter. And this introduces the idea that the Lycans are winning. They do have a new leader. He is super swole in the same way that Quint was in the last movie. He's got his own stash. He's shooting up like a junkie, some kind of supply of hybrid blood, but he's going to need more if he's going to get the final victory. Lycans are winning, but they need a definitive victory that he's not prepared for. Here's the thing. Marius is boring. He's no Michael Sheen. He's no giant werewolf like we got in the last one. I don't know who this actor is, but he's just a boring dude. I do not care about Marius. I agree completely. He is the absolute worst of all the Lycan leaders. Mom walked into the room and she's like, oh, is that Adam somebody? I was like, mm, oh, Adam Driver? I guess he kind of <laughs> vaguely looks like him. I've seen him in stuff. I believe he was in Casino Royale and some of the Daniel Craig Bond as some suit. But 
yeah, he isn't a remarkable actor here. And even when they do have remarkable actors, I usually feel like, you know, the Brits are just kind of keeping the stiff upper lip and getting through it. But I, yeah, I'm not going to defend Marius. He's a boring leader. Good that he's winning. But I don't know. I kind of miss the idea that I could root for Lycans. I always, I guess, secretly feel like they were the sympathetic ones, maybe why the third movie is my favorite, that we're back to the idea that poor old vampires who have all the money and power are the ones that are losing here. Good. Yeah, I will say, again, it's a shock that the humans don't seem to be involved in this war at all. Mm-hmm. Like, I guess they just went away for reasons. And yeah, I've liked Lycans more. Even in the part four, the Lycans had a cool evil plot that they were trying mm-hmm. to pull off. The fact that now the vampires, these covens, are back in their castles doing their Zoolander thing, as you would say, Stuart, like, boring. I want them underground. I'd like that grittier feel of four. The fact that they're going to be lounging around for most of this film, hate it. Even the vampires say that. They're like, we just stick with our stodgy ways, whereas the werewolves, they learn new things. Like, they've got some self-propelled drilling bullet that they shoot David with. Yeah, they call it a tracer. I thought it was just a trace where they're going to run off to when David gets shot. Like a spider tracer. Yeah, but the fact that it's like drilling down into him, I'm like, oh, okay, whatever. (laughs) So Celine has to do surgery on him, and she says, I'm just trying not to kill you. Um, he's a vampire. Is she doing surgery with ultraviolet light? Not only that, but he died in the last movie, and she just reached in and squeezed his heart a few times, (laughs) and he was fine. Yeah, I don't understand the rules of how vampires die in this. I get it, the sunlight will do it, but sometimes you can just stab them through the spinal cord, and that will do it too, I guess. Yeah, it seems to be that swords are like an evergreen. (laughs) A sword's always going to kill whatever. When in doubt, don't worry about the full moon, silver, garlic, crosses, all that crap. Just stick to something you can impale. They do touch on the fact that she used her hand to revive... The son, Charles Dance, is back here against his better judgments, I'm sure. (laughs) Mm -hmm. He needed a house payment. And he does say with some wonder that because of the Corvinius blood, Celine was able to resurrect his son. Right. Yes. I assumed he always felt like he was the next Bill Nighy. I assumed he was taken over and was going to be the new leader. But we get this complicated series of. All right, let me walk through this. So he walks into the vampire lair, and you say the vampires don't evolve, they don't have new ideas, but I'm hearing something new that I'd never heard before. Oh, this is the Eastern Coven. Oh, I was part of the Western Coven, but it was massacred. Later, they're going to go to a Northern Coven. They're trying to do Game of Thrones, right? Yeah, that's why the Northern Coven has the blonde hair like that girl in Game of Thrones. Yeah, they've always been like, what's popular? It was Matrix back in 2003. It was Lord of the Rings for the third one. What are we going to do now? It feels like they're trying to create the idea that there's this sprawling nine kingdoms of vampire lore. Not the way to go with me. I'm just going to put it out there. I couldn't get through Game of Thrones because of that reason. And I am not excited about learning about different regions of covens. That's what I'm saying. If your vampires are indoors, doing a lot of talk about councils and all those politics... Bad Underworld movie. Get away from that. Right. That's why I like the Lycans. Just stick to the basics. Bite them and be done. But anyway, so he's here at the Eastern Coven. He meets some chick named Samira who was in the Budapest Coven. (laughs) Sounds fun. (laughs) And she says, can you convince the council run by my father to bring back Celine because we're getting her ass kicked by the Lycans? And so they have all of this histrionics and machinations for him basically to send a written invitation for Kate Beckinsale to come back to the palace and be their head death dealer. And it's so, the acting here with Samira, like, sitting there, because she can't suggest it, but she, like, the way she'll be playing both sides, it's just so bad. Everyone should be onto her game at this point. I don't know Samira, I don't know Laura Pulver, so that she is coming in here as a new insidious bad vampire. She carries all the weight of blowing leaves. I wish that I felt like she was a threat. She dresses like a vamp, and she's going to have lines she drops about how evil she is, but Laura Pulver just doesn't carry the weight of any of the people we've seen before who are evil vampires. She can't even hold a candle to a Bill Nighy or a 
Charles dance, but yet we're supposed to believe she's more dangerous. I like her better than Craven. Everyone's better than <laughs> Craven. But I will say this the reason why we're supposedly not have seen her before, this is setting up some kind of rivalry here, is that back in the day, Victor had her as his number one. And then when he got a look at Celine, he threw her away. He made her go stay at the Nordic Coven and took Kate Beckinsale into the fold. You know what would have been awesome? Bring back that blonde from the first movie. Find whoever that was. Remember her? I couldn't remember a name, but yeah. Yeah, but I know what you're saying because that was my idea too. Why not just have her be the bad vampire in this one? Yeah, because she was thrown aside by Victor. So it would have been great to have her come back. And then I'd be like, oh, there's history there. I get the animosity there, that we have this totally new character here. I just wish she felt more dangerous, and instead, I think she's carrying the sexy that Beckinsale either won't or can't, because it is Samira who's in all the revealing outfits. Yeah, I think this is a female director, and I think she's trying to promote female characters, and we're going to have three different female vampires from three different regions all fighting one another and again complicated in the way that maybe game of thrones is or maybe just convoluted in the way that underworld movies always are i'm not really sure the point is that selena has nothing better going the lichens are coming for her and david anyway so she might as well go back and face the music she follows this chick named alexia back to the vampire council and they have a party for her I believed it. We were told that the Lycans were winning, and we were told that they need her there to train death dealers. I did believe that initially. I fell for Samira's ruse, because these rubes look like they couldn't kill anything. They look like the worst death dealers imaginable. It was just so weird seeing this training montage. Like, they have VR lichens running at them and <laughs> laser tag guns to shoot them with. Where is all their cool tech when they're actually fighting? Like, they're just going to have swords at that point. This movie looks bad. I just want to put it out there. It does. <laughs> There's two things to talk about. There's the aesthetic, which I've never been into. I'm not goth. I don't want to be a vampire. I don't want to wear these clothes and live this way. But I can recognize, again, in my death by chocolate comparative, to some people, this is an enjoyable thing to imagine. But I don't think those people are going to think this movie looks any good. This has had a severe drop in quality. It's ironic that it's being directed by a cinematographer. I think it's the worst looking underworld film of them all. Some of it's got to be money because it looks terrible. And I have seen some of the films she lensed. And even if they weren't good films, I'm looking at you, Ballistic X versus Sever. It at <laughs> least looked okay. Yeah, White House Down. I mean, that was a movie. I mean, again, yeah, she photographs <laughs> movies that, when they have hundreds of millions of dollars, look like other movies. But this movie looks like Underworld, the TV series, coming to syndicated television in 1997. You're being very kind because my note was Underworld, the fanfic film that you put up on YouTube. <laughs> Some of these CGI lichens look so bad, so, so bad. And I've been pretty forgiving with the special effects of this franchise thus far. The other thing is this movie feels really underpopulated compared to the others. You mentioned that the humans that were supposedly such a big threat last movie are gone. I think it's because they just literally couldn't afford the actors that Sebastian isn't back. No one is back. That's the crazy thing. Like, I thought Eve and Michael, everyone was coming back. Nope, they're all gone. I thought they would be a factor. I, I figured they'd be, you separate them at the beginning so that they can mean something when they come back into the fold. It is a surprise that they really don't. They'll, they'll explain why they're not here. They're trying to make it to their advantage that this is a lowly populated cast. They're trying to say vampires are failing. In five years, they'll be extinct. If you walk around the palace and it doesn't feel as swanky, and as happy as it was before, it's because, yeah, there's not many of them left. And so I'm just trying to go with it in that respect. But later, we should feel like there's a lot of werewolves. If they're winning, we should have Lord of the Rings kind of CGI battles that, when we get them, look like medieval times reviews. And we can't even get a good fight between Selene and Samira's lackey. Varga. Yeah, I love when she runs up that kid. It's everything they could do to be like, look, she's Trinity. She's running up the wall. I'm like, oh, this is 
<laughs> so sad. And yes, this is all a trap. Let's just boil this down. They invited Selene back so that they could take Selene's blood and frame her for murder and have her name. You know, she's already unpopular with the elders because she killed Victor. She killed Marcus. And, well, she didn't kill Amelia, but you get my point. <laughs> They're willing to easily believe that she's a traitor. Yeah, too easily. I want to know what the judicial system is for vampires because... This feels like a very shaky case against Celine. There's got to be cameras around. Like, it doesn't make any sense you'd walk in with a bunch of UV bullets and kill all the other death dealers. Yeah, not a good strategy for taking over. I agree with that. But, again, this is not a very crafty, clever, dense plot. It's basically, yeah, the villains are like, if we shoot everyone in the room and it's only us and her, it's our word against hers, my dad's going to believe me. My thought was when this happened, I'm like, Wow, I didn't see that coming. I didn't see Samira poisoning Celine and framing her for all these murders. But then I'm like, there's one thing to be unpredictable. There's another just to be dumb as hell. And this <laughs> falls into the second category. You can't predict stupid. Yeah, the fact, I don't know, maybe Celine does deserve to go to prison or whatever, be held accountable for some kind of crime. Because the fact that Varg is able to take out all these death dealers with two guns, none of them get a shot off, none of them get away. He takes out like 20 of them and bad training. And not only that, I'm just going to point out at the end, he is still allowed to be a part of the Vampire Council, whereas Sabara will be handled. Nobody knows he did this. Yeah, I guess that's it. He's working <laughs> under her orders. I think the screenwriters forgot that he did it. <laughs> I want to point out screenwriters that have made other movies that feel like these kind of movies. Last Witch Hunter with Vin Diesel. Better than this. I didn't see it. <laughs> never seen it. Priest. I've never seen this one, but Paul Bettany. Vision is a vampire, a man of the cloth. That one, I would say, is not much better than this, but it looks better. Hmm. Okay. They don't feel like they'd be much better. But yes, I'm not having a lot of confidence that this is going to get any better. And by this point, I'll be honest, guys, this movie is under 90 minutes. It's like 80 minutes with 10 minute long credits. <laughs> and it took me three days. <laughs> this is where I stopped the first time. It was after like, we've stuck her with Nightshade and we're going to trick them all. And I'm like, I just, I can't. And I turned it off and it took me a day to come back. It can't be good when you go the face off route and take days to finish it. Yeah. Let me tell you, Stuart, it's better just to get it over with. It's like pulling off a bandaid. <laughs> just stick it out. <laughs> I stuck it out, but it does drag, because I'm with you, Stuart. I'm like, 90 minutes, boom, let's get this done. And it felt eternal. It really just was not pulling me in. It just didn't even look good, and I've never felt the vibe of this, and no one's having any fun. It was a chore to get through this one. So when I came back feeling ready for it, I'm like, all right, what happens next? How does Celine get out of this one? Well, shit, even I wouldn't have predicted. You want to talk about being surprised? Surprised and stupefied, Charles Dance agreed to do a sword fight. That is, <laughs> oh, fire your agent bad. I love Samira's wire work <laughs> as she jumps up to get that sword. It is fantastic. Cracked me up. Oh, my God. I appreciate that Charles Dance wanted to do more in the sequel than he did in the last movie. But this is not a good look. Not a good look at all, sir. My brother, Noomsi, stop this. <laughs> And what's confusing is the whole thing is Samira's trying to drain Celine's blood. Everything we've seen, like David became a daywalker because just a little bit of her blood got in him. And right. she's got like pints of it. <laughs> she's got a big gulp. Yeah. She's got a chalice that she can't even lift up. That she has to wait till the end of the film to drink <laughs> because, yeah, the poison has to break up first. <laughs> yeah, that was when I turned off the movie on night two, <laughs> FYI. But anyway, let's talk about this second part. So they're on the run. David watches his father get skewered by Samira, and then he grabs Celine, takes her out of the bloodletting trap, and jumps through the window. They have these gates that come down when the sunlight's about to rise, but they're not worried about that because they're daywalkers. And where are they going? Seriously, where are they going? Van Dorn? What is this? It's Charles Dance, right before the sword fight, says, go to the Nordic Coven. See, I did not hear Nordic. I heard Northern Coven. And I'm like, oh, are they like in the North Pole now? Because it's all snowing. But yeah, I quickly realized these are Vikings. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, maybe I misunderstood Northern as Nordic, but I'm pretty sure they do say Nordic later on, too. They do say Nordic later, yeah. Both is used to describe 
the Swedish vampires, that they are going to be their salvation. But you can't drive there, right? You can't drive to Norway from... Well, I guess they're in England, aren't they? We don't know where they are! <laughs> yeah, they're not in Budapest because that coven was destroyed, but it still feels like Central Europe. And they don't drive there. They go to a train station. They do establish their CCTV footage that Alexia looks at that shows that they're hopping a train to go north. I guess I got confused. This was filmed in Canada. And so I just thought in my head they were in Canada and somehow took a train to Norway. <laughs> mm. I'd like to suck your blood, eh? <laughs> Underworld movies have existed in their own realm. They're not geographically, seemingly related to our world. I hope they remain that way. Yeah, not bound by time, place, or reason that we are used to. <laughs> For sure, reason. And so, yes, we have this death dealer, a new Celine that's blonde, Alexia, that's being tasked to go after her. But in another twist, that might mean something to people that care. She's actually working for the Lycans. She is the lover of Marius. And Alexa, the actress, is Daisy Head, who happens to be the daughter of Anthony Head, if you are a Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan. That was Giles. Okay. I guess you're the fan. <laughs> yeah. Again, whatever we can do to get vampire fans excited and paying to see this, we're going to do. But again, it feels like Underworld has to have a forbidden love between a werewolf and a vampire, and this is the least romantic version of that scenario we've seen, which is saying quite a lot. Yeah, and it's always felt like these are supposed to be romantic things, like the two warring tribes coming together, and the vampires are always so against that. We gotta keep our blood pure. Romeo and Juliet, that's the model. And yet, there's nothing done with this relationship in this film. Mm -mm. She'll get her throat slit for doing this, but in the meantime... She's a vampire. I don't know. What does she want? She wants the Lycans to win. She doesn't like Samira. No one likes Samira. So I guess the plan is I'm not going to let her get the blood. But she is sort of partnering with Marius to overthrow the vampires. So I did feel like she's on a path to her own species extinction there. Yeah. Traitor. At any rate, let's get to Van Dorn. And we get the northern lights in the sky. We see them, they must have hopped off the train at some point, scale a glacier with some knives, and then all of a sudden, yeesh, yeah, blonde hair and people being wrapped and mummified and dunked in caves of water. Even before that, we see, I think it's Lena, and she'll show up and then disappear and show up down the road, and like, they're blown away, and it is the worst looking special effect. Whatever Adobe After Effect they're using to make her transport around, awful. It is really a bad effect. I mean, they're like, how is she doing that? It must be some trick. Yes, a bad trick. <laughs> <laughs> a trick that anyone that's played around with an Apple IIe could probably do. And I'm not impressed either. This is, again, it's the resentment of, I know you think you've got Game of Thrones here. But don't tell me just because she's wearing the same white wig that this is the same thing. It's insulting to try and say that this has the same level of complexity. I may not have watched Game of Thrones, but I respect what it tried to do. And this is as bad of a riff on Game of Thrones as the series has been on The Matrix. And this mummification ritual, because vampires are already dead. Or I guess in this world, they just have a disease that makes them change. But... This is a death for vampires, and they'll come back and have more special powers? That's my understanding of what's being said here. Anything anyone wants to add here <laughs> might be helpful. I heard they took poison, she wraps him up like a mummy, dunks him, and they go to see Valisa. Not Valhalla, Valisa, the in-between place. To me, that just feels like coded words for... I like to kill people. <laughs> is this a one-day ritual? Because it seems like Celine's going to go through it very quickly. My impression was this is when Marcus was asleep for hundreds of years. I thought that exact same thing. I thought this is just what the Nordics do with their elders instead of putting them underground. Look at you guys making connections to other <laughs> films. Oh, it never occurred to me that vampires are always sleeping. I feel dirty now. <laughs> yeah. Well, we do get a tie back. Again, we've already spoiled it in the plot summary, but David is finding out that he always thought his mother was lowly born and that his dad was kind of a chump. But we get flashbacks to the third movie and he's handed a... Uh, okay, 
It looks like a golden snitch. I have Harry <laughs> Potter on the brain. Yeah, I wrote down holy hand grenade. I went with Monty Python. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, open it up. And then there's a ring with like a square of blood. And then you drink the blood. And because blood to them creates the memories and all of that, you can replay the third movie and then insert footage of Charles Dance to say that he was there during the rise of Lycans and got with Amelia. And there's enough blood in that little silver Christmas ornament that later all the other elders can drink it too. Yeah, she left multiple vials <laughs> just in case. <laughs> yeah, I know. Celine had to give the big gulp, but yeah, you can just like dribble this ring blood forever. Anyway, it just makes David important in ways that he didn't feel important to the story so far at all. A movie and a half, I'm like, this guy is useless. Now he's Return of the King. That Okay, yes, we've talked about how they're trying to keep up with trends, but they are going back in time because this is Aragorn taking his seat as the king of Gondor in that final movie. Just straight ripped off. They give him a sword and everything. And again, they need to give this guy something because it feels like he should have, by this point, had something going with Selene, right? They should have hooked up or something, but Selene is not in that kind of mood. She claims she's grieving for Michael, but I don't know. You're right. She's cried a lot about her kid. I don't feel like it's about romance at this point. She doesn't think Michael's dead, though. Remember at the end of the last movie, Michael was alive. Yeah, he was a popsicle in a cryo tube, and he jumped off the roof or something to get away from her. It looked like everyone was going to stay together and find him to find out that her kid ran off or whatever happened, and she's just been wanting death to come for her, not looking for Michael. It's bizarre. But the Lycans are going to come and bring some life to the Nordic kingdom as they're just going to assault this entire clan and Selene is going to get her ass kicked. I mean, Marius is able to just beat her down. I did not see that coming because Selene never really lost a fight before. You might be right in the other movies, but can't we agree that Kate Beckinsale in this movie is not happy to be here. Oh, 100% agree. Yeah. Always her character has been resigned and not extroverted. But this definitely feels like contractual obligation or I gotta pay for my divorce lawyer. Yeah, during this fight with Maria, she's just gonna like roll under the ice and go in the water <laughs> to get away. And I think she's trying to escape the film production doing that. <laughs> Yeah, she's being thrown through walls and over cliffs. She's barely putting up a fight. I feel like she just doesn't care. And why should she? I can't think of a reason to care. But it doesn't help this movie that's already struggling in so many ways to keep pace with the bad movies before it that she can't even find anything to give this project. Just makes it feel like the whole thing is sinking under ice. I gotta feel bad for her, though, because at this point, she's 43. And they've brought in two much younger vampire women to undermine her. They brought in a 30-year-old and a 20-year-old to really play the sexy. And so she's left just to get slammed around by this third-tier lichen. But this is my point. This is where the superstar says, this is my franchise. I'm not going to be minimized. You will feature me with this. I am going to be doing this. And I'm going to be hot as hell when I do it. And you just don't feel like she cares. You just don't feel like she's, again, maybe she just wants to be on the set of the Jane Austen movie, but she does not want to be back in this cat suit. I just feel like at this point in the film, if you're the screenwriter, you stop and go, okay, we got to retrace our steps. Because what happens? Alexia shows up, stabs her, licks the blood off the sword. Oh, she really doesn't know where Eve is. <laughs> where is this movie supposed to go at this point? <laughs> Marius can't get what he wants. Selena's dead. You got to go back and start over. I really was like, this movie has just ground to a halt. Marius' entire plot is foiled. And that's the end, right? Yeah, Selene's not even looking for a kid. It'd be one thing if everyone is on a quest for the same thing. But Selene is just like, I don't know. What is she doing? She's just like moping around in a Nordic vampire coven. They stab her and then realize she's not helpful. And then they, I don't know, her blood's not good enough. So they just walk away. That this chick, Alexia, will go back to Samira. And Samira will know that she's being betrayed and slit her throat. And that's the end. And yeah, so I guess David pulls Celine out of the ice that she just kind of crawls into. She just like, 
okay, I'm dead, good, crawls under the ice, he pulls her out, and then they do the mummification ritual. I know she's coming back, and yet I am still stunned at the idea that much of this movie is now resting on his shoulders, and she's just not a factor at all. That he's been given such a central role was almost whiplash-inducing, because he felt so inconsequential last film. He was there, but he didn't feel like anything more than a disposable sidekick. Wasn't even a love interest. Yeah, he was just sort of this himbo. He feels so halfway written into this with this whole Aragorn story as he returns as the leader of the Nordic tribe. But if this was Michael, I don't like Michael as a character, but I would understand if the film became about him. Yeah. That is someone they spent a lot of time Mm -hmm. setting that character up. This David... He was barely anything in the last film. And now you're telling me he's the most important male vampire? Yeah, that's the thing about Underworld in general, is it acts like it has all of these dynasties and legends to tell you. And then when it's time to tell you something about him, you're like, oh yeah, he's just standing there. They just don't know how to make characters interesting. They don't give them backstory. They don't give you a reason to be invested when they're told, okay, now you're the vampire king and ride back in. And stop Samira from drinking that big gulp of blood and throw down that this is your house. And she pours more blood on her front than she drinks. (laughs) Oh, that thing is hilarious. Yeah. Does she have to chug it? Is this a kegger? (laughs) Can't she sip? I know. She's suddenly John Belushi in Animal House. It's just hysterical (laughs) to me. But yeah. So like she's covered in blood, killing people and telling daddy, it's my house now. And then David walks in with a ring and a golden snitch and everyone's like, nope, him. I can't believe she doesn't start attacking everyone as they get these memories. She killed all the other death dealers. Do something at this point. You have your super blood. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's why it's always a problem with these blood powers. You can't really frame people for crimes. You can't really do these kinds of plots if all it takes to undermine them is to bite someone's neck and go, oh, no, it happened this way. So... Maybe that's elder power. Maybe not everyone can do it so successfully. Everyone can do it. It was shown in the first film they all can. Yeah, Alexia did it. And more to the point, we're at the end of the film. Believe it or not, it's taken three days. But on another level, this is it. This is all they had to offer. All of a sudden, all the lichens in the universe are descending on this last vestige of vampirism. Why are they doing this? Because they couldn't find Eve to get the hybrid blood. They're just going to do it. So let's just do it. He's just got one more vial, so it's got to be now, I guess. And there's no reason to think that they'll lose because, again, there's like 10 vampires in the place. Yeah, and they're attacking during the day. I love that the vampires are almost completely annihilated because of their love for impractical architecture. Yes. They built these castles with windows. Sun makes them die, (laughs) and they still put windows there, so all the lichens have to do is shoot out the window shades. Yeah, use heavier-duty shades. Think of the purge. Really bring down those roll cages. And there's only one lichen shooting the windows out, I feel like. Take out that machine, that shooting shells at them. Varga and Selene both fire many clips of bullets uselessly against the people firing this gun. What happened to the silver nitrate bullets from the first film? Those have totally gone away. Like, the one thing that would really stop these lichens. This production can't afford silver. (laughs) Yes. I also want to point out, the further hampering of this low production is the fact that we're saying they're lichens, but it's just guys with perma-stubble. They are not doing the wolf effects until the very end. And maybe they shouldn't have done it then, because, (laughs) yeah, we're just having people that look identical. I'm grateful when the Nordics arrive, because they all wear white, and I can keep track of who's who. But by and large, these are indistinguishable people firing on each other and blowing up windows. This battle, down to the score, feels like the Battle of Helm's Deep. The Nordics showing up like the elves, and even the score, it feels like they're really trying to rip it off. And yet, we're watching people fighting on a stairwell. Yes. (laughs) It might have a Tolkien aspiration, but the presentation is minimalist, and that's being kind. But we're eventually going to just get down to two face-offs, and I wasn't sure... Who would be the one to fight Samira? Would it be Selene, who Samira poisoned via Varga? Or was it going to be David, who's the rightful heir and who Samira would want taken out? But I guess because Selene was previously beaten 
by Marius is going to be Celine versus Marius rematch while David goes and sword fights Samira. And it should be said, when Celine shows up, she got that new hairdo. She's half Nordic now. Mm-hmm. Hannah Montana, kind of streaky. <laughs> I mean, it's an okay look. I make fun, but it doesn't look bad on her. It just, it's not a cheer moment. I doubt that if I were in a movie theater, anyone would have stood up and gone, woohoo. Maybe if they set up this Nordic coven to be a really cool thing, like in the first film, that'd be a big cheer moment, but who cares? Right. They had established earlier that Samira had come on to David, that she wanted to take him to bed, and then she had to go with the lame Varga guy. I don't know what beef they have, but he hasn't liked her from the beginning of the movie, and now he can run her through with a sword. They have a big sword fight, and he stabs her after she stares upon the sunlight without being hurt for the first time. It's sort of just the side battle, while the real stuff is Celine finding out. She lures this Lycan guy, Marius, into the armament, shoots him in the face. I was impressed with that. Gets blood spattered into her mouth, and then she can taste the fact that he killed Michael years ago and has been shooting up that hybrid blood. Yeah, did Michael get killed before he escaped the cryo chamber? Because I thought that's what they said in 4, that he got away, but this flashback looks like he died there. Yeah, I'm not quite sure. I assumed he jumped off the roof and they were there with a dog net or something like that, and we're like, <laughs> now we got you. Like and blood for Marius. Not sure. I missed it. It happened fast, and I was not going to rewind on this. No way. <laughs> But yes, yeah, Celine's mad. You killed my lover. We can finally have me romance David because I'm never getting Scott Speedman. And I need to be the one to kill you. And you guys were happy that it was so gory last time. When she pulls out the spinal cord, when they present the severed head, is this doing anything for anybody? No, I'm just wondering, oh, Justin should be here. This is Mortal Kombat. We just saw a fatality. I really thought it looked cheap and not very gory. And if she could do that, did she have to have this Nordic blonde power to do it? Is that why she didn't do it earlier? No, she had to have that to do the illusion to trick him earlier. I don't know. I know I didn't like it the last time, or I didn't dislike it, but I wasn't saving the movie last time. Here it feels like they can't do it as well. And yeah, she basically holds up a head and everyone's like, go home. It's over. <laughs> yeah. Is that how wars work? You yeah. kill the leader and everyone just stops and leaves? It is how this blood war does. And all of a sudden we're in an epilogue that says, Celine and David are the new king and queen of something or rather. And Lena, don't forget Lena. She's one of them too. Well, help me out with this image. I didn't figure this out. So Lena's there. And she produces from her sleeve a black tress, what looks like the hair of Eve, I'm assuming. Which we saw Celine take earlier in the film, and I guess Lena took it when she was mummifying Celine? Oh, I didn't catch that. Yeah, because even Alexia sees that in her when she gets her flashback to try to figure out where Eve is. Okay. All I'm curious is about is that we cut from this moment to her walking up to something on ice and it just is over. And I think it's Celine, and I think it's Eve, but I'm not even sure who these two figures are. I just took it as Celine and Eve. That's what I took too, but I'm not 100% on that. Okay, we're getting the whole Celine narration over it too, and she's reborn, there's no ending, there's no beginning, it's just becoming. And it feels like they brought in crew members, stand-ins, to say, oh, we need an extra shot here, just to tease the idea that what we might do next time. In the off chance this movie makes money. <laughs> right, yes. It's a mother-daughter reunion, probably. Wiki told me that anyway, and I guess I'll believe them. I went the same way. I was like, Wiki said it. I'm like, really? That's what I saw? I mean, that's what I assume. That's what would make the most sense. Again, I also assume that the editors realized they needed this shot and could not get Beck and Zale. Yeah, it is not a great shot. Or anybody else back that would establish who they were so they just keep it low lit and we cannot be sure who was walking up on who. But hey, it's over and I'll celebrate that. Well, how much will you celebrate? Jacob Stewart, do you recommend Underworld Blood Wars? Jacob. No, this is bad. At 90 minutes, this film lagged. It was painful to get through because it feels weird that a franchise with so much lore just throws out so much continuity, like Michael and Eve. No, I guess we don't have money for that, so we got to go something real low scale, and this feels generic, this one. It's just like, we got vampires, we got werewolves, they're going to fight. 
and if it wasn't for the brown arrow pleasure of those Nordic tribes showing up, I don't know how much fun there would be to have here. It's a real slog. Don't bother. You don't need to go to this world. Not recommend. Stuart. Yeah, not recommend, not surprisingly. I've recommended none of them, and <laughs> this one does itself no favors by grabbing on to the latest trend, which in this case is a TV show that I can't get into because I don't want Nine Realms of Lore. What else they do is just more of the same, only sadly, it doesn't look like a cool music video. You could say that about the first one. It might have been incomprehensible. I might not have cared, but it did look cool, capital C. And here, all the wire work is dimly lit, unconvincing. The actors seem to be having no fun going through the motions, hitting the marks. The word I kept coming to was sparkless. It just felt like there was no energy at all to presenting any of this information. It was just a nonstop data dump from people that are not excited to be doing. Unless you're a hair fetishist, I don't know what you would get out of seeing all of these people. It is underfunded, underacted, and unbearable, even at 80 minutes. Yeah, you talked about the lore, Stuart, and you know this whole series problem is it's just very luring. No matter what they do, they cannot add any excitement to the lore. It just becomes compounded and confusing, and you could tell by watching this fifth film that there was no grand design when they did the first film or even the third film. They're just throwing shit at a wall and seeing what sticks, and I was disappointed because... Each film had been a little better than the last one for me, to the point that Part 4 even got a recommend out of me. I didn't think it was humanly possible that I would do that. And so, coming to this one, I had a slight bit of optimism that it could be the best. I mean, that's the trend the series had been going on. It is just... I can't believe it's as short as it is. For as long as it feels. I did watch it in one sitting. I didn't have to spread it over days. <laughs> but I couldn't believe that it took that long to get nowhere. This movie is empty. It's not just a budget thing, but the budget does not help. This movie has nothing in it. It just feels the most inconsequential of all the Underworld films so far. And that's really saying something at this point. <laughs> Let's lean into that. Inconsequential might be a word I'd use to rank the series. I don't like any of them. My favorite remains the third one. I think it's the only one that satisfyingly addresses the aspiration for Romeo and Juliet tragic love. Michael Sheen and whoever that woman were are the best Romeo and Juliet vampire and lichen lovers. And in some moments, it kind of pulled off the Tolkien thing. Again, it's all about imagery. That's what makes me rank one over the other. That had the strongest. Then I'd rank number two because it had the cool villain with the bat wings. I'll go with four because it had a lot of blood spatter. And then it's a coin toss on the first and the fifth. <laughs> but I think because this fifth movie looks so bad, I'm going to go one and then five. So three, two, four, one, five. And yeah, for me, four, I gave that one a green arrow, barely in relation to the rest of these films in this franchise. It was pretty fun. The gore in there won me over. Three, you're right, the best Romeo and Juliet part of this. Two, Marcus, he was like a cool bat villain. That is the sole reason two comes before the other ones. And yeah, I really had to think about five and one. Like five, it's shorter by a half hour, even though it feels just as long. <laughs> good point, good point. I like the idea of Nordic vampires. I think that's why I ultimately put five before one. One is just too long and real boring. Yeah, honestly, my feeling is the less Scott Speedman you have, the better an Underworld movie you may have. Oh, wow. Because I think my ranking of this is four, three, five and two are pretty much tied, but I guess I'll go two, five, one. Yeah, come on. Yeah, two <laughs> is clearly a better film than five. Two does have the nice bat creature, but other than that, I don't know that either of them had much for me. But I dare ask, after having ranked them, is this the most abysmal series we've ever covered at Now Playing? Is this the most <laughs> waste of our time we've ever done? Or, to put it another way, will you write a letter of apology to The Haunting? Because you previously, last year, said that was the worst Now Playing <laughs> series you've ever done? Come on. Yeah, it can look so much better. This is the most worthless, is what I can say. And The Haunting, I went into with hopes. 
And here, I think we knew what we were getting into. We knew what this was going to be, and we reviewed it anyway because, hey, it does sort of tie into Twilight. So if we were ever going to do Underworld, now's the time. Should we have ever done Underworld? (laughs) That's a question for the ages. We don't have many franchises left, so we'd have to do it at some point anyway. Why not? Yeah. I don't think this franchise has a thousand more years to live. I'll put it that way. In Celine terms, when she's talking about, I might last another century or I might die tomorrow, I'm like, eh, I think you're dying right now. I think that this is over. I really think if they ever make another one, it'll be a TV series with new actors. Oh, total reboot. Or Netflix movie or something. Like, yeah, totally. And they really have an opportunity to really... Instead of throwing cool images up at the screen and then trying to figure out in the editing room what it all means, they could actually create a plot or something before they film anything. It might help. Yeah, maybe not have stuntmen write the script. Mm Mm-hmm. There's your start. (laughs) It'll need an ensemble, too. I want to say having everything being about Sour Celine was a real pill. They tried that with David here at the end. I like him better than Celine. But there is a chance that we aren't done, that we are just pausing, because... Yes, when this movie came out, they talked about doing one more. Let's finish it all off. Let's give it a big send-off. And Kate Beckinsale said, I've done enough of those. But just a couple of years ago, she was asked again, and she's like, yeah, I'd be up for doing another one. So if they could get the financing together, Len Wiseman wanted to do one. He talked about possibly doing a crossover, he got together with Paul W.S. Anderson, and they were like, you know, we could do a crossover with Resident Evil here. (laughs) Oh, that would be hilarious. It just confirms the fact that they are the same thing. But again, (laughs) in my mind, Resident Evil is a lot more fun. But I don't know what you get by combining them. I just, no. I think, I'm not the one to ask, because vampires and werewolves aren't my thing. Ask the people that really love that. But my instinct would be, Don't go any further with Kate Beckinsale. Don't do it. Could you reboot this in an interesting way? Or is this just so tied into the lore and the aesthetic that that is what an underworld movie is? And if you want to do vampires versus werewolves, you just don't use this title. You could do a requel with Eve being the main character growing up or something. But you got to get away from this aesthetic and all this lore, like streamline it. I just want to see werewolves ride motorcycles and shoot machine guns. Shouldn't be that hard. At a certain point, even the look becomes just downtrodden and unappealing. Like, it's tiresome to constantly be in these darkened alleys. Even if you're, like, marveling at the aesthetic, at a certain point, it becomes too much. And I'd like to see them go on Hawaiian vacation or something. Like, you have to really be more creative than this series has ever been, and more creative than I can be in making suggestions. I don't know how you fix this, but you've got to think bigger than they ever did. Bigger cast, more interesting characters, more visually appealing different places. I guess they tried by going north. They had the northern lights in the sky anyway, but you get what I'm saying. This movie has existed on being small and cheap, and that's why it's a cult audience and not a major hit. Well, are we going to get better... Out of Twilight. Also coming to an end this week, this Friday, we get Breaking Dawn Part 2, the last part of the last book. Perhaps the best film? That's my memory anyway. We are recording this show before I have seen any Twilight, but by this point, I will have strong feelings about it. It ends on a high note. Whether that's a green or brown note, we'll find out. So hopefully you can join us for Twilight this Friday. Details at nowplayingpodcast.com forward slash donate. And now that we can finally put Underworld behind us, my will is done regardless. My journey has now come full circle. Once an outcast... I am now one of three chosen elders, from hunted to the highest honor. But I no longer fear death, for I have known it once already. Thank you for listening to this Now Playing Podcast movie review. We've been silenced, but otherwise unharmed as ordered. 
We hope you enjoyed the show. You've done exactly as I hoped and planned, if not more. Help us spread the word about this show by leaving a five-star review on Stitcher, Podbean, iTunes, or your podcast store of choice. Why are you helping me? I'm not. I'm helping me. Want more reviews like this one? In the archive section of NowPlayingPodcast.com, you'll find more than 1,000 in-depth movie reviews from our panel of hosts. There is no beginning. There is no end. There is only becoming. On our site, you can hear reviews for every installment in the world's biggest film franchises, including the Marvel Cinematic Universe, Star Wars, Spider-Man, Batman, X-Men, James Bond, Middle Earth, Jurassic Park, Fast and Furious, and Transformers. Enough to produce an endless supply of... Plus, we have individual movie reviews, such as Avatar, Titanic, E.T., Inception, Big Hero 6, Ready Player One, Pulp Fiction, Apocalypse Now, Doctor Strangelove, and hundreds more. Dead or alive, you will give me what I want! And come back to NowPlayingPodcast.com next Tuesday for another all-new movie review podcast. Peace. By delicate peace, the puzzle will fall into place. Support from listeners like you keeps Now Playing Podcast on the air. Yes, I have taken from him, but I have given so much more. You can donate directly by tapping the support button at nowplayingpodcast.com. I can assist you. Well, you already have. And you can join our crowdfunding campaign for early access to new episodes, exclusive reviews, and bonus reviews. Pains me to admit it, but for the first time in my life, I genuinely fear for our future. Need more Now Playing? Subscribe to our In Focus weekly newsletter for exclusive digital download giveaways, celebrity interviews, behind-the-scenes insights, and more. Sign up through the subscribe page on our website and get it delivered to your inbox every Friday. I need you to deliver a message. Grunt if you understand. (laughs) You can also compare notes with us on Letterboxd. Go to letterboxd.com forward slash now playing to see what our hosts are watching when we're not recording podcasts. And follow Now Playing on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and our YouTube channel. The vampires didn't realize you were following a human, did they, Race? No. Want 375 more Now Playing reviews? Get the Now Playing book, Underrated Movies We Recommend. Arnie, Stuart, Jacob, and Marjorie reviewed 125 different movies you probably haven't seen. But you should. Find out why in Now Playing's first book of movie reviews. Do you not realize this is a gift I am giving you? The ebook is available now, and the audiobook and print book will be coming soon. Find details at nowplayingpodcast.com forward slash book. My eyes see beyond the surface of so many things. Now Playing Podcast is produced by Arnie Carvalho. Without me, you'd have nothing. You'd be nothing. Associate produced by Jason Latham. There's no room for error with me. Now playing is edited by Heath, Stephen, Santiago, and Arnie. I kept the secrets, cleaned up the mess. Now playing credits read by Brock. I contact preventing him from making a change. The opinions expressed in this podcast are those of the individual hosts and may not reflect the views of Enganza Media Incorporated. Why would I listen to your lies when the journey to the truth is so much sweeter? Venganza Media Incorporated is not affiliated with, and this podcast has not been prepared, approved, or licensed by any entity that created the film analyzed herein. All movie clips and music included in this podcast are the intellectual property of their respective copyright holders. They are included here for the purpose of review, and no infringement is intended. These rules are in place for good reason and they are the only reason we have survived this long now playing podcast is an exclusive trademark of and may not be used without the express written permission of vinganza media incorporated we are getting reports on what appears to be a mass cleansing now playing is a vinganza media production copyright 2022 and no part of this show may be reproduced repurposed or redistributed without the written permission of vinganza media incorporated All rights reserved. We fought our greatest battle in our darkest hour.
After centuries of war between vampire and lichen, this may at last be a time of peace. <laughs>